Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So today we're gonna go over um, high, bl uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. So this is a uh, part of your cardiac um, weekly assignments. Um, so you might go over this sometime, I believe in like med search one, sometimes fundamentals touch up on it. Um, so yeah, if you're new, my name is Gabby. I'm an ER nurse and I love to teach and this is why I do these things. Um, so feel free to leave any questions that you guys have throughout the video down below, or of course you could always contact me through Instagram. So the reason why I wanted to touch base and just talk about hypertension on its own is because it's not that it's lengthy, but it's something that is very important for you guys to know the basics about because it's very common in our practice. Um, once you start seeing patients, a lot of patients have um, high blood pressure. A lot of them are on medications to control their blood pressure. And it's a disease that a lot of people don't pay a lot of mind to it. And it's actually very important because hypertension can literally kill you. Um, with different factors we'll talk about it uh during the the whole entire slide um show but it's 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 why i just focused on hypertension on its own um in this lecture okay so let's get started so like i mentioned before hypertension is high blood pressure um you can remember it by um what it what the actual word is which hyper um you could think about it, about it as being high um, this is something that's chronic, so you won't have a patient where you'll receive them in the hospital and like all of a sudden they have high blood pressure. Like it doesn't work like that. This is something chronic that starts uh, to occur. Um, and then I added a little picture here showing you guys the difference between a, like a healthy um, blood vessel versus a blood vessel that is hypertensive. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of narrowing. And if there's narrowing, blood flow is not being able to go through um, properly. So there's different types of causes that could cause high blood pressure. Um, for sure, I've seen this specifically um, on exams as a select all that apply. Um, and if it's not a select all that apply, a lot of the time, the answer is always smoking. Um, but just so you guys know these are like the main causes that could cause high blood pressure so stress smoking a sedentary life where the patient is literally like not doing any exercise whatsoever obesity uh birth control um has a high risk of causing clots but as well causing high blood pressure um the diet if the patient is on like high sodium and high cholesterol diets um, a lot of diseases can cause high blood pressure like diabetes renal disease um, heart failure and hyperlipidemia, um, which is over 200. Um, and again, these diseases like play hand in hand with high blood pressure. So high blood pressure can exacerbate um, with, this with these diseases as well. Um, so if a patient has like diabetes, not necessary and, and high blood pressure, diabetes um, may have exacerbated their high blood pressure or caused high blood pressure. Okay, so it could be like one or the other um also african um, men tend to have high blood pressure as well and aging the older you get the the more um prone you are to getting high blood pressure now it is very important to know what happens when high blood pressure is not treated this is the this is why i was mentioning that high blood pressure is very overlooked because um, a lot of people are like yeah i have high blood pressure it's fine like i'll be okay like, no, it, you're, you're not going to be okay because eventually um, it's going to start um, causing different things in your body. So I wanted to kind of like go over like what high blood pressure could um, cause in different parts of the body. So in the brain, we could put the patient or the patient could put themselves at risk for a stroke if they don't treat their high blood pressure. For the heart, of course, high blood pressure is because of, you know, circulation. So in regards to the heart, um, you know, the patient is at risk for a heart attack and a heart failure. For the kidneys, um, they're at risk for CKD. For the blood vessels, they're at risk of scarring. Um, so scarred arteries, which is arthrosclerosis. And then for the eyes, um, they're at risk for retinopathy. So if you think about it, 
all of these things could occur because of narrowing blood vessels okay so if you remember and we could go back to this picture your regular blood vessels like this but if you have a narrowing of the blood vessel there's less space for more blood like your regular blood flow to occur right so let's say that the bl the the blood has to go to the kidneys the kidneys are not having enough sufficient blood flow to them so what is going to happen it's going to start causing kidney dysfunction um the the eyes retinopathy there's not go, uh, blood flow going to the eyes the stroke you could have an ischemic stroke because that narrowing and that pressure that the heart has to go against to pump blood towards the brain is increased and it's not normal so eventually it's going to cause issues so this is something that's very important and as a nurse it is very important for us to teach our patients this um i always say it that honestly like being a nurse you have to have empathy you have to be on top of your patients and want to teach them because there's a lot of patients that they're diagnosed with things and they're not taught well they're living with things and they don't know the risk that could happen if they don't take care of themselves and this is something that i always talk about when i talk about diabetes as well and as an er nurse i ask my patients what medical conditions do you have and they'll clearly flat out tell me i don't have any medical conditions and i'm like okay so what medications do you take at home and they'll give me like five medications that are related to high blood pressure and i'm like okay so you're on these medications and just because you are controlled doesn't mean that you don't have high blood pressure. So it's something that we need to be on top of as nurses that we need to teach our patients how, you know, we need to educate them. We need to teach them that if they have high blood pressure, they should be taking their blood pressure before these medications because a lot of these medications will bring their their um their heart rate down. I have a lot of patients that come in as a syncopal episode or near syncope and then I ask them what medications they're on and they're like on a beta blocker um, and maybe it was like a new dosage that they got so it's very important to ask a lot of questions when you're um, triaging or you're or you have this patient in whatever unit you have them and um, educate your patient okay so the signs and symptoms of high blood pressure it sucks um, most of the time because I always say that high blood pressure is a silent killer because a lot of these patients do not have any symptoms. These patients and a lot of patients will not know that they have high blood pressure until they either go to the hospital and they see that they have high blood pressure. They go to the primary doctor. If they even go to the primary doctor, I'm guilty. I haven't gone to the primary doctor in like, let's say like three years. So if they don't go frequently to their primary doctor yearly, they won't realize that they have high blood pressure. Um, if they don't go to their cardiologist, if they have, if they follow up with a cardiologist, they won't know. So unless they don't really have like the regular symptoms of high blood pressure, which is usually when they are in hypertensive crisis, which is like a headache, blurred vision and chest pain. Um, most of these patients are going to be living with high blood pressure and they won't know until like the very end when they are in like stage three or like in hypertensive crisis, unfortunately. Um, so it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, I'll go over um, a little bit into that, but I've had many, many multiple patients that have came in and they're like, oh my God, I've never had high blood pressure. And they're like in their fifties. And I'm like, maybe it's because you don't know that if you've ever had blood pressure, because honestly, like no one goes and checks their blood pressure every day um, unless they have like a headache or whatever. So um, yeah, like a lot of these patients will not be symptomatic. Um, when when they have high blood pressure um labs and diagnostic exam so if this patient comes in uh to the hospital or if you're doing family uh you decide to do like family care as a nurse practice uh, as a nurse practitioner you're going to know that you're going to notice that the doctors are going to order an echocardiogram usually these things are done outpatient but depending on the patient if they come in for a certain like um uh, certain things like chest pain or like hypertensive crisis the patient will be admitted and these things will be ordered um, by the cardiologist in the hospital so the echocardiogram what it does is that it monitors the blood that's being pumped out of the heart that's called the ejection fraction this is something that you want to know for your exams because it might be asked so your normal ejection fraction should be 55 to 70 percent 
remember that memorize that you need to know your norm less than 40 percent is uh, is confirmed heart failure okay so i want you guys to at least if you can't remember both just remember that less than 40 percent is heart failure okay um we're also going to be ordering like an ekg to see like the electrical um like the electrical function of the heart and usually three blood pressure uh, measurements that are one week apart confirms that the patient has high blood pressure, okay? So the patient will be, for example, like if the patient goes to a cardiologist or if they go to the primary doctor and they notice that they have high blood pressure, the doctor will tell them, okay, in seven days, you're going to repeat your blood pressure, okay? And you're gonna jot it down. Seven days from that, you're going to do it again. And then if the blood pressure is elevated, in those three times, they that confirms that the patient has high blood pressure. Because keep in mind that high blood pressure, oh, sorry, our body goes into homeostasis. We go into like fight or fly, we get anxiety, we get stress. So sometimes we have high blood pressure for a moment because of like the certain, um, I guess, uh, I, how can I say it? Like whatever is occurring in that moment. Like, for example, if like something happens and it stresses me out, my blood pressure might go up. Or if I get like very angry, my blood pressure will go up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I am diagnosed and I have high blood pressure. Okay, so you'll see that a lot of these patients that come to the ER, they'll like all of a sudden have like their pressure in like the 140s or 150 systolic, but they have like no history of high blood pressure. Of course, they have like white coat syndrome, they're anxious, they're nervous. So those things are not something that you're going to be um, saying, oh, okay, this patient has high blood pressure. It's because of the moment. So that's why to diagnose high blood pressure, you want to do it like weeks apart um, to see if this is something recurrent or if this was just like, okay, the patient went to the hospital or the doctor's office and she was like, you know, um, scared or stressed or she doesn't like the doctor's offices or whatever and her blood pressure was high. So that's very important to keep in mind um, because I have had to literally calm down my patients when they come into the ER and they're like, oh my God, my blood pressure is in the 150. That's never happened. And, you know, you have to calm them down. Like, you know, educate them about the situation and things like that. Um, for blood work, uh, we check the BNP. This is the B-type uh, natriuretic. I don't even know how to say it, but it's a peptide that we have in our body. And basically, this kind of helps us um, with uh, checking if the patient has heart failure. Um, excuse me. I was still sleepy. <laughs> um, so it, it helps us uh, with uh, heart failure. So you're going to see this um, when we talk about heart failure and then high blood pressure, okay? So um, our BMP should be 100 and less. That's our norm. And then from 300 uh, to 900 is where we have like the mild, moderate, and severe, okay? Now, cholesterol. Cholesterol is very important for this exam. Um, if you're touching up on high blood pressure and things like that, you need to know your cholesterol levels. You need to know that your HDL is your good cholesterol. So that is the only one that you want to have more than 40, okay? Remember that, HDL, think about H as in happy, happy cholesterol, more than 40. Um, and then the rest of them should be less than a number, so your total cholesterol needs to be less than 200, your triglycerides less than 150, and your LDL should be less than 100. So make sure that you know that, okay? Now, this is something else that you need to memorize and know because they are going to ask you um, in your exam. They might give you like a case scenario and then it's going to ask you like what stage the patient is in. Um, so you need to know your stage one, stage two, and what hypertensive crisis is, okay? So your regular blood pressure should be 120 over 80 or less, okay? Your hypotensive, which is low blood pressure, no good, is 90 over 60 or less, okay? Your blood pressure could be elevated if it's above 120 to 129 systolic over 80, that's like something that will say like, oh, the blood pressure is a little bit elevated, but it's not something that he, we're here like concerning about. We'll just, we're just monitoring. 
Stage one will be with your systolic of 130 to 139 and a diastolic between 80 and 89. Stage two will be 140 over 90 or more. And then hypertensive crisis, which is an emergency, is 180 over 120 or more. Okay, hypertensive crisis, you are literally at risk of a stroke. I've had patients that have came into the hospital with systolics of 200 and something. That needs to be controlled ASAP. Your patient could literally stroke out. Now, um, sorry for the noise as the baby playing in the back. I'm sorry. Um, this might not be on your test, but like I said, I love educating you guys. And especially if you're thinking about going into um, a cardiac unit, an ER, um, and where wherever it is, if you have a patient that has high blood pressure and they come into hypertensive crisis, one thing that a lot of people think is like, oh my God, I have to drop the blood pressure like now. If your patient, and I want you guys to remember this and I want you to take this with you forever, especially when you're a nurse, because the same way that a patient could stroke out with a blood pressure of in the 200 systolic, if you drop that blood pressure too fast, you could get that patient to stroke out as well. Okay, this is something that I have argued with floor nurses and it's something that that like it's not, you know, that we have to educate a lot of people on is that if the patient arrives to the ER with a blood pressure of 220 over 190 and I gave the hydrolazine or I gave the labetalol or whatever the medication is, you cannot expect that blood pressure to go to 120 over 80 within an hour. Because your patient will go into literally shock and will literally stroke out, okay? You cannot drop a blood pressure so quickly because the heart will literally go into shock, okay? So please keep that in mind um, because it's something that's not educated. I've had, you know, a lot of nurses on the floor when I give a report for patients um, with hypertensive crisis, they're like, oh, but the blood pressure is still you know, 160 over something. I'm like, yeah, I understand. But the patient arrives with a blood pressure of 220 over something, and it's only been an hour and 30 minutes. I am not going to continue giving medications. And if you want to verify with the admitting doctor, I will be gladly okay with putting a communication order on whatever the doctor says. You know, and a lot of these nurses don't know because they've never been educated on this. And it's horrible to say, but, you know, it's it's just lack of education that um, that we don't have. OK. And of course, these things you will be learning when you work um, on the floor and you work as a nurse. You're never going to know and learn. You're never going to know everything. I still lack a lot of information and I learn every day. This is why I love the ER so much because every day I learn something new. Um, but it's okay not to know everything, okay? You're never going to know. You You might be a nurse for like 50 years plus and still not know everything, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, so for high blood, uh, hypertension crisis, um, like I was mentioning, you're going to give beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, vasodilators like nitro or hydros, um, hydrolazine. And most of these patients are going to be admitted to ICU, um, depending on if they're controlled or not. I've had a lot of patients that I've been able to control their crisis and then they go to their step-down unit, um, sometimes even like to a cardiac unit. But if it's like a hypertensive crisis where you're not able to control it, most likely ICU is the one that admits. So the beta blockers are going to kind of reduce the high of the heart rate um, because a lot of these patients are going to be tacky because the heart is trying to compensate with that that um, pressure that the heart has to pump the blood that the body needs. Your calcium channel blockers are going to relax your uh, cardiac muscle and your vasodilators are ba basically going to dilate, reduce that high, um, that, that tension that the vessels have. Um, and they kind of like go hand in hand um, with one another. Just make sure we'll go over the medications, but just make sure um, how these medications affect you in a way. So you need to know that the beta blockers um, affect the, the heart rate. So if you have like a patient that has a heart rate in the 50s, you're not going to give this medication because you're going to put them in bradycardia. Uh, but we'll talk about the medications now in a little bit. 
oh here we go so this is a slide for the medications so um the patient when they have high blood pressure you're, you're gonna see that the doctor is going to be ordering either ace inhibitors beta blockers calcium channel blockers diuretics or vasodilators um i was reading up like a story and i was talking to my friend about it because she actually was the one that mentioned to me that the first line now um, that they're trying to do and use for patients that are having high blood pressure is diuretics, especially hydrochlorothiazide. It's something new. So when she told me that, I actually um, started like looking into it, uh, reading some case studies, and indeed, um, they are actually shifting to diuretics, um, hydrochlorothiazide to be exact, for the patients with hypertension. Um, but that's not something that's going to be in... Um, in your exam is just you know i'm just giving you little things that will help you when you become a nurse and just extra information if you're if you like the extra information but for your exams you need to know about these specific uh, blood uh, blood pressure medication classes so for your ace inhibitors they all end in pril now the thing that's going to be asked in your exam is um things that you have to look out for and stop the medication right away. So ACE inhibitors could cause angioedema, okay? I've had patients with this and you need to be careful. Um, these patients could stop breathing on you if um, if their, their airway is constricted with the swelling, okay? So this is something that you need to educate your patients on about if they start noticing that their face starts to swell, their lips start to swell, they need to go to the ER ASAP. If the patient starts to have a cough, this is something that's very, very common in exams, the cough. So they'll give you a patient and they'll say, okay, you have Miss um, Patricia that went to her primary doctor. They diagnosed her with high blood pressure and they started her off on ACE inhibitors. And for the past two weeks, she's been having a dry hacking cough. What are you going to be doing? The answer should be change this patient to an ARB ASAP, Okay. ARBs are another drug class that you need to know about. They end in sartin. They do the same thing. They, they lower your blood pressure, but these don't have those risk factors of angioedema and the cough. So your answer choice will be always to change the patient to an ARB if they have um, any of these issues. Okay, um, ACE inhibitors also could cause low sodium and high potassium in the body. So you want to be able to educate your patient in regards to that um beta blockers uh they end in low like i said they block heartbeats um so you cannot be giving these uh medications if the heart rate is 60 or lower um it lowers the blood pressure as well so it, it we give the we give this medication a lot of the times when the patient is either tachycardic um, so when, when you're giving this medication, when a patient is tachycardic, you you need to look at the blood pressure. Okay. So you need to look at, okay, this medication, all, I'm giving it for the heart rate, but I need to realize that also this medication lowers the blood pressure. So if the patient's blood pressure systolic is a hundred over 60, you're not going to give this medication because then you're going to drop their, their, their blood pressure and you're going to put them in, hypoten uh, in hypotension, hypotensive. Um, these are also beta blockers, okay? So if your patient is um, asthmatic or if they have COPD, this is not a medication that you should be giving them. You should do like an alternative medication because it could cause breathing problems. And then this is also something that's going to pop up in your exams. Beta blockers could also mask low blood sugar. Okay, so hypoglycemia. Um, you might you might have like patients that are presenting with like those symptoms, and it's not there. And you check the sugar, and the sugar is fine. It's the beta blocker acting on the on the body. Okay. So just make sure that you know that because that is for sure going to be on your exams. Now for calcium channel blockers, like I said, these calm the heart. Um, diuretics, they drain out fluid. So you need to know the difference uh, between the potassium wasting and the potassium sparings. You need to know that furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide will drain out fluid, make the patient pee a lot, and potassium will go with it. 
Now, if you have a patient that has issues with potassium and they have low potassium, you're not going to be giving them furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide. You're going to be giving them spironolactone. So if you get a question on your exam and it's giving you a case study and it's saying that the potassium is 3.4, on the patient, what diuretic are you going to be giving the patient? You're not going to give them furosemide, you're going to give them spironolactone, okay? Now, just make sure that for spironolactone, you're educating your patient that they need to avoid salt, okay? For your vasodilators, these relieve pressure on the heart. Now, if you're going to be giving the patient nitroglycerin, you need to make sure that you question this patient and <clears throat> ask them if they are taking Viagra. Um, because Viagra, Viagra does the opposite of nitroglycerin, and you will literally kill your patient if they give you nit um, if they give you if they if you give them nitroglycerin. I've had multiple times where I asked the patient, and um, the wife is at bedside or somebody's at bedside, and they they don't want to tell you, and I literally tell them, I'm going to be giving you a medication that if you're on Viagra, you will die. So I need you to tell me if you are or not. Like it gets to that point, and then they're like, yes, 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 I take it. Okay. So it's very, very important to educate your patient before also giving medications in regards to that um, because sometimes they are going to be shy and they're not going to want to, you know, tell you that they are on Viagra and you need to tell them, like, literally, if I give you this medication, you will die and they will tell you that they are or not on the medication. And then hydrolyzine is a very common medication. It works very, very quickly through the IV. It's what we usually uh, use when a patient is... Um, is hypertensive in the ER. Um, and those are usually gonna be like a PRN order. If you work on the floor, you'll see that if the patient is admitted and they have high blood pressure, you'll have like an order for PRN hydrolyzine or PRN um, metoprolol. And now for education, you just wanna educate your patient in regards to like high blood pressure and their medication. So if they have high blood pressure, you wanna tell them that they need to be on a low sodium, uh, low calorie and cholesterol diet. They should be reducing their alcohol and caffeine. Exercise uh, about 30 minutes at least five, uh, five times a week. Doesn't have to be strenuous um, going to the gym, but at least walking for 30 minutes around the block or around their house uh, will be amazing. They need to stop smoking. Um, give them information about uh, smoking. Um, like um, I think it's like, uh, I forgot. It's like pamphlets and things like that. There's like cessation um classes and groups and stuff like that so just educating them on that and then also stress reduction which is very hard we all have stress but the more that they reduce stress the better um their blood pressure will be and that is pretty much it for high blood pressure so if you guys have any questions feel free to drop it down um here on the on the youtube comments um and also if you see that i don't respond you could always contact me on instagram I do want to mention that a lot of you guys have been contacting me on Instagram and um, for some reason, some of your um, que uh, questions and like messages are going into like my hidden files. I don't know. So if I take long, just, you know, um, message me on both um, or comment on one of my pictures, whatever it is, so I could see um, that you guys message me. So that is it. Um, I'll see you guys in the next video and good luck on any exams that you guys have. Um, soon. Bye guys.